Well, this morning we're going to start our message a little bit differently than normal. It actually is a good application of what our message is all about today. Um, we're going to do an interview with a couple of our young ladies here at the church that are going back to Haiti. And uh, we're going to talk about their story a little bit and how we can help them to go back. So at this time, I'm just going to ask these young ladies to come out. Emily Pfeiffer and Christine Meredith, please. All right, just have a seat here. And just going to talk a little bit about what your plans are for this summer. All right. She's had a little trouble pushing off of one foot because she messed up some tendons this week on it, so we're glad she made it to her seat, though. All right, ladies, where are you going in Haiti? Um, we are actually going to be returning to Mission of Hope. We had the opportunity um, to go this past January and then also um, two years ago. Okay. And um, who will you be working with there now? Again, this Mission of Hope. And in particular, what kind of things would you be doing there with them? Um, I'm actually going to um, be there for a little over a week. I will be um, doing vacation Bible school with the kids that will um, travel from the different villages over to um, either right on the main campus at Mission of Hope or at Bercy, um, which is their second campus. Um, so they'll travel there and then we'll be able to do vacation Bible school with them. And in the afternoons, um, we will do um, village time, or we will return back to Bercy, and they have um, what is called Grace House, which um, I'm really excited about. I've never got to stay on the Bercy campus, and it is um, a house that is for elderly people, because in Haiti, when you get to a certain age, your family basically stops taking care of you, and so if you don't have anyone to take care of you, then you're just kind of left alone, and you don't really have anything, um, which is very, very sad. Um, so the, um, Mission of Hope de designed this house that um, these people could come and to live there and get the health care that they need and just live out their life and, in a safe place. I know. Yours is a little bit different, Emily, isn't it? Yes, mine's a little bit different. So I've been super blessed with the ability um, to go and intern for the summer. Um, I'm going to be there for 10 weeks from June to August, like 11. And I am going to be leading missions teams. So the short-term missions teams come in each week. I'm going to be on the main campus, so probably a different one than she is. But um, I go out with them, and I just get to lead them in sharing the gospel, first and foremost, like in the villages. Um, and then we get to like play with kids, spend time with the people, and kind of just um, there's different villages that Mission of Hope has. There's like six or seven of them that they go to. So it'll be different for me each week, but I get to like participate in that and in sharing the gospel, but also like to lead the people um, that are there, especially those that are there for the first time. And then I also get to lead them in doing like service projects. So kind of some of the things that we did when we went there for like the short term um, missions trip. Um, there's things like kids club. There is painting, of course, and then we have like solar lights and water filters that they do. Um, just some super cool opportunities to like witness to the people through service and things like that. And so I'm super excited to be able to do that. Yeah, 10 weeks and then one week for you. Mm -hmm. I suspect that the, you know, one week for you has something to do with who you are, but <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing her. I always get her about things. So. This one here, you gotta watch. So that's all I'm saying. Um, so, now both of you obviously have been there before. Let me hear a little bit of the passion that you guys have for going back. You're talking about some of the things you're going to do, but really there's some other things that are, I think, behind as far as your passion for going back. Um, two years ago when we first went, um, I've been on other mission trips and like have enjoyed them very much and just saw the, word, the Lord, I can't talk, the Lord working. Um, but this when we went two years ago, God just really like spoke to my heart and like I saw a completely different side of the mission field. Like I never experienced anything quite like going to Haiti. Um, there's just so much that they don't have and we're very privileged here in the United States to have the freedoms and like to be able to go and have a nice place to live and different things. And so as we were there, like I just, 
my heart just broke for those people and they just had such a joy and like they had hope for something better and like when we would ask to pray for them like they wouldn't ask for like things you would think they would ask for like they asked that the Lord would help them grow spiritually if they could get to church on Sundays and things like that and it just kind of broke my heart and I like main thing for me is like I saw all these little kids and like I didn't really know before I went that like they don't really have a school system and like it's so difficult to like see like these I remember the first year this little kid would like he followed us around like the whole week and I think and he would just carry these notebooks and uh, and like we kept asking him like what he was doing and he was said he was waiting for someone to sponsor him so he could go to school yeah. and like that hit me so hard and I was like oh my gosh like they just desire so much and like but yet they live such simplistic lives and they live for God like they just wait and they hope and they they hope for things to to get better for them and so I actually am going to be moving there yeah. um, next year um, to be a missionary and I got offered a spot to teach English so I'm very excited about that um, so I will get to visit there um, this summer as well. So I'll be there a little bit longer than a week, but I'm just God has just continued to pull that on my put that on my heart, and I've prayed, and He's opened doors. So I'm very excited. Lots of things that we just take for granted, but you just see it in a completely different light when you go to a place like Haiti. How about your passion for going there? Emily? Yeah, like she said, I went for the first time two years ago as well, um, and then I was able to go back in January, and so I just. Yeah, God has pulled on my heart, like, the minute I went to Haiti, and, like, even before, I just knew he was calling me there and calling me there, um, and so he's done, like, big things in that with this internship. Um, I wasn't really expecting to even apply for it, but I did and got it, um, and so, like, he's been super faithful in that, as he is in everything, and so, like she said, the joy that they have was just amazing to see, and there's so many, like, people who are lost in Haiti, just, like, everywhere, um, and so, like, just to be able to share the gospel with them, and some of them who, like, have heard it, and maybe just, like, the seed was planted, and to just be able to do that and then also like their joy their joy is just it kind of radiates and um you feel it um, i'll never forget the first time that we went we met this woman named marie and she was a christian because we'd asked her about like her spiritual life um and she said that she knew Christ and had a personal relationship with Christ. We got to talk to her a little bit more about that. And she didn't have much um, materially, but she just was so strong in her faith. And when we asked her to pray for her, like we said, how can we pray for you? And she said, well, just that you, that I could like continue to walk faithfully with Christ through everything and through every trial. And then she asked us to pray for us and I will never forget it. I didn't know a word she was saying, but like I did feel the spirit moving and it was just the most amazing thing. And then she sang over us, which was super cool as well. Um, and so just things like that, as well as being able to love on the kids, they are just amazing. I think kids are the same everywhere and they just come up to you and they love you despite anything. And like, there's no barriers and there might be like a language barriers, but there's no barriers in love and so it was just amazing to be able to like do that as well now the timing for you guys going you're going 10 weeks you leave in early june mm -hmm. and you're not going until july but somehow that god works something out there between the two of you there that i think i'd like for you to talk about a little bit um, yeah, I actually applied to go as an intern as well, and they kind of told me I was too old. <laughs> uh, I should have picked up on that when the application said, do you have your parents' permission? <laughs> that, <laughs> that should have tipped it off. Um, so I was just really kind of upset because like, I felt like God was just pulling on my heart, and I didn't quite understand why he had closed that door. But then as it went on, he opened other doors. And um, so I went in to apply just to go for the summer um, and all of the slots were filled. And I was like, oh no, like now I can't go at all. And so like I applied, I, I, well I called and um, talked to one of the um, ladies that's in charge of the groups. And she says, well actually, we really need someone to come and do vacation Bible school. And I was like, I love to teach. And so um, it just so happened to work out that I could go in July. And Emily is a diabetic, and so she needs to have stuff brought down to her about halfway in between in her trip. So I will be that person. So. Yeah, it's amazing how God works those kind of things out, isn't it? Yeah. 
So I'm glad you both get to do something you really enjoy doing. And I know you're going to be a great blessing to those kids down there. Now, a little bit later on, I'll tell you how we can help support them in making their trips this summer. But uh, I just wanted you to hear a little bit of their heart for going and what they hope to accomplish for God there. So thank you so much for coming out today, ladies. Okay. Thank you. All right. Probably some of you can tell I'm not feeling so well today, but I was bound and determined to get here today because that interview with those ladies has so much to do with the message that I'm going to preach today as well as basically what we've been talking about in the book of Philippians. I don't know how many times I didn't sit there and count, but did you hear the word joy? The joy that these ladies have and the joy that they see in those kids down there and the people of Haiti who don't have much to live by, but they're sure that God is going to take care of them. All that ties together in today's message. So here's where we'll go with it. This message, to God be the glory, is taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 23, which is the last section of this passage or this uh, book. I'm going to begin with this idea. The source of joy is found in the Lord. Now, we've been talking around that subject for all these weeks, but just as kind of a concluding statement and yet an entry into this message today, the source of joy is found in the Lord. Now, you remember Paul's context as he's writing this letter. Paul's sitting in a prison in Rome, and uh, he's really waiting execution. But yet he writes this letter that's filled with all these expressions of rejoicing and joy, he writes this letter to these people in Philippi. They're not in jail, but we learn from other passages of Scripture they're not a wealthy church. They don't have very much at all. But he's reminding them of the fact that circumstances don't determine your joy. Joy is a contentment that you have in spite of circumstances around you. So Paul begins with this idea today, and <clears throat> first part of the message is just simply joyful contentment <clears throat> in every situation. Joyful contentment in every situation. So again, Paul writing from jail, he writes these words, beginning in chapter 4, verse number 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know, that what is to, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in, in, a, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The word that jumps out there to me, knowing the context here, is the word content. Content. Now, when I looked that word up in, in a lexicon, it said this, it's a perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed sufficiency of the necessities of life are there. Now, I don't know how often we can feel that content. You know, I, I don't know that there are times when I feel like there's not a whole lot of contentment in me when uh, things aren't going as well as you'd like them to go. But Paul's simply saying, you know, I've learned when things aren't going as well as I'd like them to go or when things are going really well, it doesn't seem to matter. I have a contentment. I have this satisfaction, this sufficiency that everything is going to work out fine. So he's expressed it in a couple of ways here as we read our text this morning. First of all, he says, I want you to rejoice in the concern of others. This is what he's really saying to us. He's thinking about these Philippians who hardly have anything, but time and time again they seem to scrape things together to send support to people who really have some needs. They're sacrificing themselves. Paul says that I have a long relationship with you and we have not been together for a while, but you have renewed your commitment to me you're concerned for me by sending a gift, an offering, while he's there in jail to provide for some of his needs. He's pleased about this continuous concern that they have for him. And the Philippian church shows tangible evidence of their concern for him through the gift that they sent. You know, sometimes we just, we get blessed by so many different people, people expressing it in one way or another. And it's important for us to realize that when we get blessed by other people, we need to rejoice in that, especially if they're really make an expression of love. There's a, a feeling of sacrifice that's attached to it. They're just letting you know, I appreciate you. I'm concerned for you. So when Paul receives this from the Philippian church, he feels the need to express it to them. I'm just telling you, I appreciate it. I didn't, not that I asked for it, 
Not that I necessarily need it. God always supplies for my needs, but I'm letting you know I appreciate your thinking of me, your concern for me. How good are we at doing that kind of thing? Just simply, when we get blessed, just returning the blessing and just telling somebody, thank you for that, gratitude for being so nice, and just to feel that joy that comes knowing that others are concerned for you. Now, Shelly and I have a neighbor that lives across the street that many of you know. Her name's Kathy Burnell. And out of nowhere, a lot of times, Kathy just calls and says, hey, I got something for you, and we know what it's going to be. It's a meal. She just cooks this meal and cooks extra for herself and for her family, but she cooks some for us, and so we get this nice meal, and it's always well appreciated. A lot of times it just shows up when it's really convenient for us. We're maybe having time, uh, stretching our time, and uh, she just simply does this kind of a thing. So I'd always tell her, hey, thanks, Kathy, for, for thinking about us, you know, but she just wants to show her love and concern, and it's good to have people who are concerned about it do in that way. So rejoice in the concern of others. But then Paul says, rejoice in Christ's sufficiency. Even if others don't get a chance to show that concern, you know that he's going to take care of you. Paul has always known that the source of contentment in all situations has been found in Christ. That started the day he was converted to Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus. It went through all kinds of things, beatings he had, imprisonments he had, times where he's able to see the, the fruit of God's work in his mission as he touched people's lives for eternity. And now in this confinement, it doesn't matter where he is, what's going on, he has the sufficiency of Christ. And he's been through some tough times. If I go back in the book of 2 Corinthians, and I look at chapters, chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, I've got this problem. I don't know what it is. It's called a thorn in the flesh, but it's some kind of a physical problem, and it offers a hindrance to him. He'd love to have that thing go away. But I want you to listen to what he says is the final analysis for him. But for my power, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Hear what he's saying? God will supply. He will be sufficient to give you everything that you possibly could need for whatever situations you're involved in. And this is a great parallel to that verse I just read earlier from Philippians chapter 4, 13, where it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or through him who strengthens me. You know, when I first read that, I thought that it was saying, anything I set my mind to do, God's going to give me power to get that done. I know that working of Christ in me, and I can do anything I set my mind to do. That's not exactly what Paul's saying. It's not a Superman type of claim. That whatever I'm doing, he's in it. I'm going to get it done. No, what he's saying is, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength in the things that he has assigned for me to do. There's a difference there. Because a lot of people say, well, I should be able to, to do this over here and this over there, and I need this much money, and I need this much support, uh, I need people in my life, and, you know, you start figuring everything out. That's in your own strength a lot of times. Whereas simply you just need to say, God, what is it you want me to do? And he'll begin to show you a certain direction. And I've always told you the thing that you've got to do in a relationship with God. Find out where he's moving and then join him there. And you'll find out that wherever you join him, he's got things for you to do. And you can be confident of this, that he will take care of every need that you have. Everything he assigns to you, he will help you get done. So what does God want you to do today? That would be a question to ponder. Not just what you think, but really pray and seek him out. What does he want you to do today? So there's this joyful contentment in every situation that you can be appreciative for the relationship you have with others and how they bless your life, and you can also then know that Christ is going to be sufficient to take care of all your needs. So you're joyful in your contentment, but you're also showing a joyful gratitude for support, past and present. Paul loves this church, the Philippian church. They were among the first that came to be believers as Paul was sent out on a missionary journey. They have always supported him wherever he went. No matter what the needs, they seemed to hear about it, and they would meet those needs. So going back to the fourth chapter of Philippians, he gives us a little bit of a history lesson of how this works. He says, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your 
acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. You, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Gratitude for continuing personal blessings that, that come from the relationship that you enjoy with other people. Paul's always been blessed in his ministry. Past gratitude, as he thinks about the times when he was, you know, in places where he didn't have very many needs uh, being met, and yet he was confident God was going to show up big somewhere or another. And here's these Philippian people of all churches. He could look at places elsewhere where he had been, people who had more to give, but it was the Philippian church, this one that he had this interesting relationship with. This is the one that he says, you have blessed me time and time again, and I am grateful for your, your blessing in my life. But then also he says something most interesting. It's not just a past gratitude that he's thinking about. It's a present gratitude in their behalf. Now hear that. Paul's not just saying, I'm grateful for what you guys have done, but I'm grateful for what God is going to do for you because you did. I wasn't looking for any kind of gift, but I'm amply blessed now that you have sent this gift, and I'm able to be sufficient in all my needs. But I want you to know, and he says this very carefully, he says, I want you to know that your investment in me, I expect, will be a blessing from God in heaven who has an account in your name. Now, what he's saying is, when we make offerings to the Lord, when we're helping other people out in the name of the Lord, you know what's going on? God's taking note of those things. The word that he uses here, he says, I hope that it bears more fruit for you in your account in heaven, meaning I hope that you get interest. As a matter of fact, one of the commentators said he's really using language of yielding fruit. He always liked the farmers like to get plenty of good fruit from their, their work. But he also says there's, a, there's a, a banking term that's used there about the account. And what he's saying is, is, I hope that God gives you a blessing in terms of how much he puts on your account. The phrase that's used there can actually mean not just simple interest, but compound interest. That's what Paul says, I hope that you get that in heaven with all the things that you're doing for God, for his kingdom. I hope he blesses you. So I'm grateful. I have this gratitude. Joyful for the support that you give me, past and present, but what God is going to do presently for you as he has this account for you in heaven. All of this happens when you make your commitment to Jesus Christ. Our lives are not just to say, well, for once in a while I'll make a sacrifice for somebody. It will happen consistently when you've made the number one sacrifice that Paul writes about in Romans 12.1. Paul says, if you're a believer... I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Offering themselves, not just what they had, they offered themselves, which then put into context everything they owned, and they were able to give, even beyond what most folks would say they could give. And God's saying, I'm going to bless that. That's going to be blessed for eternity. So what kind of a yield may you expect from your sacrifice or for the sacrifice of other people? Just another question to ponder. Joyful gratitude for support, both past and present. Joyful contentment in every situation. And then Paul says this concept of joy, joyful certainty that God is in charge. God can do everything because he is in charge. There's a passage there that I want to close with at the very end of uh, the book of uh, Philippians. Philippians chapter 4 verses 19 through 23. Paul says, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Could have ended the letter there, but notice what he says next. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings. Now hear this. Especially those who belong to Caesar's household. I'll say more about that in a second. Then he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. There is a certainty that God meets all needs. He meets all needs. 
Consider what provisions God has given in your life situation. Probably, if we're honest, we'd say much more than I deserve. That's how God blesses me. I am sufficient much more than I could have ever expected. It's a promise that God makes to all of his people. Going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I want you, or, or chapter 9, I want you to look at verse number 8 with me. Paul says this, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That has an application most specifically to God taking care of your financial needs, but it really is true of anything in your life. God will bless you abundantly beyond anything you could expect, the needs that you have in your life. Now, why, would, why especially wouldn't that be true if, if this is a known fact? The book of Psalms tells us that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know what that is? That's a statement saying God owns everything. And he can pull from those rich resources and move them anywhere he wants in the world, through whomever he wants. God can take care of every need we got. His resources are that great. But it all begins with this over in Colossians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 27. Paul says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that's us, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is, in, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You want to know where it all begins? Is when you embrace Jesus Christ. He comes into your life. Christ in you. Now what it says is the hope of glory. You want to live in a place where it's going to be glorious, where we won't have any of the problems that you normally have in this life, the worries that we have. You want to live in a place like that? It all begins with knowing that you have a treasure inside of you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What that means is God is in charge. If you belong to him, he takes care of his own. God is in charge. The certainty that God is in charge will also lead us to this, a certainty based on his glory and grace. As Paul gets ready to wrap up the letter, he just says, all these things I'm saying about joy, all these things I'm saying about Christ, all I'm, I'm saying about relationship that we have with him and through him, all I'm saying is it comes down to this. His glory, his glory is what causes everything to move in this world. He just doesn't sit and bask in his own glory. He just pours that glory forward into our lives. And we need to know how blessed we are so that we can give him glory back. It's reciprocal. And he's certainly worthy of it. I read a book entitled The Lost Symbol. I don't know how many of you read that book by Dan Brown. Interesting book. But it ends in Washington, D.C., and the two protagonists in the, in the story happen to be near the very end of the book, the very last pages. They happen to be at the very top of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Nobody ever goes up there. You know, there's this little walkway right there. The only thing that's above them is just that one statue that's there. That's it. But nobody's able to go up there. But when you see how this thing develops in the story, you know this is where they end up. And it's, it's gone. They've come through a long night. And now as they're in this place, the sun is just beginning to come up the, over the eastern horizon. And they could see the first crimson rays of the sun. And as they turned then away from that, they looked out into the city, which was still dark. And they could see just the shadow of the Washington Monument. And as they're looking at that, from this vantage point, and somebody had set them up so that they could see this. He wanted them to really see what was there. Dan Brown writes about it this way. Across the mall, a tiny speck of golden sunlight was glinting off the highest tip of the towering obelisk. The shiny pinpoint grew greatly, greater and brighter, more radiant, gleaming on the capstone's aluminum peak. Langdon watched in wonder as the light transformed into a beacon that hovered above the shadowed city. He pictured the tiny engraving on the east-facing face, side of the aluminum tip and realized to his amazement that the first ray of sunlight to hit the nation's capital every single day did so by illuminating two words on that capstone, Laos Deo. Do you know what those words mean? It's really true. Those words are at the very top of the capstone, 555 feet in the air. Laos Deo means 
Praise be to God. You know, our founding fathers understood we are so blessed, and he's made everything so sufficient for us. They understood that and wanted to give glory back to him because he's so glorious. And so I think it's interesting as these people who set up our nation just had these little things all around us to remind us how good God is, how glorious he is, how really gracious he is, too, because God's grace certifies he's in charge. He doesn't have to do anything for us, but he does things for us all the time, gives us so much to live for and to live with. He gives freely to all. <laughs> Even as Paul is writing, he says, I'm in a Philippian jail, or in a, in a Roman jail, and I'm writing to you, the Philippians. You know what he's really saying? There's people who take care of me here. They're part of Caesar's household, whether they were family or servants, but they've become Christians because I'm here. God's grace reaches everywhere, even into the darkest places, and touches every life. And so Paul's just saying, as he finishes this letter, glory to God who is so glorious and gives so much, and how gracious he is. Glory to God, because he is gracious. You know, it's interesting, as Paul begins this letter with words of grace to you, that's exactly how he started the letter. Everything's about grace to him. Everything's about the glory that goes back to God. From beginning of life with God to the end of life here and then throughout all of eternity, God, through grace, is always in charge, and we can live confidently because of that. I thought it would be good for us to close with just a reminder, simple reminder, of God's grace and what it means to us. I'm going to have words put up on the screen here. I'm going to ask Joe, if he, wherever Joe's hiding right now, there he is, if he'll help us on this. We're going to sing about three stanzas of a great hymn that reminds us of God's grace. Let these words just sink in deep as we go through this. Father, we thank you for what you've revealed to us as we've studied the book of Philippians. We're grateful for the joy that gets beyond all circumstances, the contentment that we live with each and every day. We're thankful, Father, for your glory as it emanates from heaven and touches all of us, and we just give you glory back, all that you mean to us. But most importantly, for the grace that saves us, the grace that brings us into a right relationship with you, Father, I pray that each of us today will appropriate that grace on a daily basis. And as the sun comes up on our lives each day, we may think those words, Laos, Deo, praise be to God. And may we live our lives in that context. So bless us with joy that we may be an instrument of joy to touch the lives of other people. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.